welcome friends to a 24 hour readathon vlog. I have been craving, you guys have no idea, I have been craving a reading intensive day. A day where I can put aside all of the responsibilities and just sit down and read for, if not all of it, then most of it. And today is that day I have cleared my schedule and the only thing work-wise that I have to do are sprints, which work out perfectly because I can just use sprints to motivate myself and keep on going with my reading. But the plan is to read for the next 24 hours and all else be damned. And I am quite, quite excited about it. It's currently 8.14 and I'm not starting right away because I do have to go to the gym at nine. But once I'm back and I have had breakfast and all the things, I am starting the readathon at 11 a.m. today. And from 11 a.m. today to 11 a.m. tomorrow, we are just going to be reading the day, the night, and the morning away. For those of you who are not familiar with 24-hour readathons, it's basically a time that you set for yourself and challenge yourself to read as much as possible. My goal is not to stay up all night because that's just unrealistic and I can't do that for the life of me, especially with like going to the gym and everything. I need to let the muscles rest and so I'm not staying up all night, but I will probably stay up a little bit later than usual. My bedtime is anywhere between 9.30 and 11.30 and so we'll likely stay up maybe midnight, maybe a little bit past midnight and then going to bed, waking up, doing it all over again. And the reason why we're here is because I have been obsessed with this book, with this series ever since I started it on Sunday and I didn't think I'd actually love it and yet we're here and that is the Mindfuck series by St. Abbey. I have been putting this book off for so long because I didn't know what to expect. People were like, it's a romance, but it's not a romance. You can also hear the cats in the litter box, but people have been saying it's a romance, but not a romance. Like you're gonna get that, but you're not gonna get that. And like, it's about a serial killer. It was just so convoluted. I got so confused and I was like, I don't know what to expect anymore. I will say it has a bunch of triggers. So if you are interested in reading this, check those first. Basically the setup for this book is that a serial killer ends up dating an FBI agent who is investigating her case and he obviously doesn't know that it's her. She does know that he's the one investigating, but she learns that later on. And so it goes into this really intricate and layered relationship between the both of them because she is not a mindless killer. She is not one of those people who are killing just for the sake of it because she finds pleasure in it. It's more of a revenge killing spree based on something that she experienced when she was younger, something that happened to her brother and her dad as well when she was younger. And and she just wants to seek retribution by annihilating everybody that was involved. And she is very methodical. She is very thorough. She plans things out very much in advance. So whatever plan she is carrying out is not, again, it's not mindless. And so the FBI is having immense difficulties with actually profiling her because she doesn't quite fit any of the profiles that they have given her so far. And it's quite fascinating and entertaining to see them kind of run around her in circles because they can't actually find the ways to profile her, to locate her, and to just end this killing spree once and for all. But the more you go into the series, obviously the more complicated it gets because of the feelings between Lana, who is the serial killer, and Logan, who is the FBI agent. And it just becomes so complicated because it obviously raises the question of if he were to find out what would happen then, would he leave her? Would he stay with her? Because it's a very tricky situation to be in. But it's super entertaining. It's cringy at times, but not in a way where I'm like off put entirely from reading it. And I'm about to start book four. So I've got books four and five left, which are roughly around both of them together, 300 pages. So I do hopefully maybe want to just finish out the last bit of the book I have got left and then make some progress with some other reads. I have got some other things I'm kind of eyeing. I'm very excited. Friends, it's not even 11 a.m. It's currently 10.53, but it's raining. It is perfect readathon reading weather. Oh, I just love it. I'm gonna have the best time this morning reading. And not only that, but Villains Are Destined to Die Volume 3 is here. So I'm definitely gonna be reading this in the next 24 hours. I am going to make breakfast, make coffee. Gym going has already been done. And I, yes, I put on the same exact outfit I was wearing before because why not? Life is too short to not put on a comfort hoodie. So it's just going to be a cozy reading day and I'm so excited about it. Let's make brekkie. Let's make coffee and then let's sit down and read. It's right there, the Mind Fox series. <laughs>
So I finished mindfuck book number four and the moment i've been waiting for the moment you've been waiting for <laughs> happened at the end of book four i have been wondering the entire time how is logan going to find out about lana and the fact that she is indeed a serial killer how is he going to react and what's gonna happen from there on like are they going to stay together like i just oh i don't know because all of these books happen continuously so one ends in a cliffhanger and then the other one starts immediately after so like there isn't any time jumps in between books like it's all just a continuous stream which is why it's all bounded up kind of perfectly in a single edition and truly what I love about the Mindfuck series is that it's gotten better as we go like there are still somewhat cringy moments there are still somewhat what they don't know is that the real monsters searching them in the dark and I'm like okay a little bit campy, a little bit out there, a little bit unnecessary. The more the books go along, the less we have of that, which is nice. And we have gotten more information. And so you find out the actual real backdrop and the real story, the more you read. That's why this is perfect instead of, I guess, like reading them individually, because each book is like less than 150 pages. So, or around 150 pages, I guess, for each. And so you kind of meet the context of each book already continuously in order to understand the full picture and so by book four we have almost the entire story but there seems to be one I guess last thing that isn't quite out in the open my favorite thing is seeing Lana's growth like is that a weird thing to say like I just feel so weird saying this shit because she is a serial killer and although she does have a moral code and she is more of like even a vigilante rather than anything else it's weird to say like I'm rooting for her because like why like I just oh my god it's like that weird reconciling of this is a real person who has suffered and is trying to heal from her trauma albeit in the worst way possible and this is also a person who's like committing real crime but I love seeing her growth and how through I guess her meeting Logan and falling in love she finds even more reasons to uh, be okay internally to kind of seek out that catharsis so that she doesn't you know wallow up in her own pain and suffering and history and so she's always trying to keep herself afloat keep herself emotionally stable so that she doesn't fall off the bandwagon and we see her become more and more stable the more the books progress which is really a joy to see but it feels so weird to say that I'm nearing the end like I'm almost done with it and what am I going to do after this is done because this is like such a unique experience and I like actually enjoyed it and I don't know what I'll do but let's get I also just realized like this hair is hanging out here this hair is hanging out here this hairstyle is absolutely awful but I'm excited to jump into the last book which is called painted all red which makes sense because the whole thing she's been saying this whole time is I'm going to paint this town red which is Delany Grove the town she is from and where the crimes were committed and it's wild to see also just how far the crime stretches how many people are involved how many people within authorities were involved in covering this shit up and just lying with like reports and judges and courthouses and everything and now getting the full truth out of it and seeing again just how far the scheme and the scamming gets is wild and I can't figure out yet <laughs> me and my investigative brain i can't quite figure out yet what's like this last thing lana's claiming that there is because right at the end of book four she's like and he didn't ask he didn't ask about the very last thing but i don't know if there's going to be another reveal or if the question she wants asked is is it you like are you the scarlet slayer like i don't i'm not sure and so I'm going to head into book five now, see what happens. <laughs> what happens if she just starts like senselessly killing me? Like, yeah, I can't deal with this.
friends, I finished the last one, painted all red, and I was flabbergasted at the end. I was not expecting the reveal towards the end because who I thought was like the other serial killer that was being mentioned throughout several of the book was not who I thought it was. And then it ended up being somebody else. And oh my God, it was so good. But then the ending was so camp that it kind of ruined it for me a bit, <laughs> just a little bit because I don't like overly camp stuff too much because it kind of takes me out. I ended up rating it four stars and I also didn't mention it for the fourth book, but I rated that one five stars. So five stars and four stars respectively. And that was a good ride. I really enjoyed the way that it wrapped up because I think what the book does ultimately is shed light on something that a lot of people like to neglect, even though it's a big reality everywhere, not just in the States, but everywhere. It's the fact that corruption as always exists and it thrives in blatant sight. And there is loads of things that are hidden by officials because of politics, because it is not a good look on any sort of bureau, on any sort of establishment. And there are things that for them are better left unsaid, better left unresolved, better left perhaps even pinning it on the wrong people instead of actually getting to the bottom of it. Because a lot of the time for them, they have to investigate close, open the next one close, and the right amount of attention or energy is not put the same from case to case and it's a very heartbreaking truth. And in particular, when it comes to cases of sexual violence, especially when it comes to cases of brutality or violence or assault towards children, especially those kinds of things are not thoroughly investigated. And here in Panama, we have got a bunch of cases like that at the moment that are so, so heartbreaking to see. And so what I read in this book even is so relevant today in the political landscape of Panama in general, that it was was extra heartbreaking just because of the things that we are seeing on the news on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment. And so I think for a lot of people out there who have read this book, it's probably something that is immensely empowering to see somebody reclaiming their voice and reclaiming their sexuality and their body and their confidence because a lot of people don't get to do that. And so I think like, anything really when I see books like these. I just think about, you know, better to explore all of these like intrusive thoughts through fiction than through like reality, if that makes sense. And so for a lot of people, this is like their form of therapy, like this is their form of healing. And so overall, Lana's journey was really fascinating because I think it's more so like a moral dilemma from the reader side, perhaps for people who haven't experienced any of the things that were detailed throughout the book is that, you know, you're kind of trying to reconcile the facts that she is a serial killer with the facts that she is a person that suffered and is seeking retribution. And she is somebody who, you know, she's sentient, like she feels and she loves and she cares. And she is not without flaw, but she is also not without reason at the same time. And so reconciling both of those things as you read, it's a very hard thing to do. And it's a huge dilemma, but you sort of feel for her a lot as you read, obviously, because what happened to her was horrible. And you root for her as you read because you're like, damn, seeing your growth, whether it's attached to, you know, the love interest, Logan, or whether it's something that is happening all on your own, you're rooting for her to grow and kind of get past that vendetta, which is why even the ending being so camp, I think that's what made me rate it a four star because I'm like, mm, I just kind of wish that wouldn't have been part of the ending. But I understand also why it was. It just, oh, I just kind of wish that it wouldn't have been. But it was such a good ride. And I think what's also so cool about the book is that you not only see the FBI investigating her case in particular, but you also see kind of like sprinklings of other cases that they're trying to solve because obviously not a single case is being worked on at a time. It's like everything's kind of happening at the same time. Sometimes things overlap. And so I really enjoyed all of that and seeing also the side characters and how invested they got in Lana's journey as well or how they post a conflict. It was just all so fascinating. Shout out to Jake, who was really a mastermind through about the entire book because Jake was really on it. Like that man was too intelligent for his own good probably. And Hadley, shout out to her as well because I really loved her. Honestly, just like that square right there and Leonard. Leonard also was really, really good. But all of those five characters like really stole my heart. And I never thought I'd enjoy this as much as I did, but I did. Like it was a really enjoyable ride. So Mindfuck series is finished and I can't believe I'm saying that. Now I am going to go cook lunch because it's 
it's 4 24 p.m for proof's sakes it's 4 24 and i need to eat lunch my face is also feeling kind of numb all on the left side it's just <laughs> a side effect of my chronic illness i've been clenching my teeth a lot at night recently which has not been great and there's really nothing to do about that like i just think it's been a result of really really bad sleep throughout september i slept very terribly out of choice really more than just it happening out of nowhere and so i think now because of the exhaustion my teeth are just like grinding on each other at night and it's not been great it's kind of what it is so i'm just going to put a warm compress on as i'm cooking i'm thinking a salad could be nice for lunch so i think i may just do that or i may just switch gears make some mac and cheese now so that it's easier to chew and then make a salad for dinner need to make a decision the chicken's defrosted anyway Anyway, so it's being used for either of the meals and my mom's also I think coming over she did text me she's here so that's gonna be a nice little hangout little break because the sprints are also over so I'll get like an hour an hour and a half long break in between this and whatever I pick up next and then I'll chat with you guys after lunch to see what I'm going to pick up <laughs> I did not expect my mom to be over for so long, but it is now 7.05 p.m. I hope you can see that, 7.05, and she just left, and we had lunch together. Well, I had lunch. She had, like, her midday snack, and then we played Monopoly Deal, caught up, talked about all the things, and now I can settle down now and read. So I did lose a few hours of the readathon, but that is okay, because that's just realistically what a day looks like. And I've decided that I'm going to start Villains Are Destined to Die Volume 3, because I am quite excited about it and my logic is more likely than not I'll finish this and then I'll make progress with family lore on audio while I do some diamond painting because I haven't made any progress on my diamond painting for like a few weeks now and I really want to do that and so it's a nice little way to unwind before deciding if I want to switch books before I go to bed or if I carry on listening to the audio while I get ready for bed and so decisions will be made later on on that but Villains Are Destined to Die Volume 3 is the order of business I've already read volumes 1 and 2 and I love the series so much. We follow our main character who gives in to the hype and she starts playing this really popular game. She falls asleep and then she wakes up in the game playing in hard mode as the villainess, Penelope Eckhart. She is posing as the lost princess, duke's daughter, but not unbeknownst to anybody like she is doing so under the mandate of the duke himself and so the whole point of the game is to win affection points and hard mode it's super easy to lose them whereas in easy mode it's super easy to earn them but as somebody who's played the game before she knows what will get her affection points there are moments in which that's more unclear than others and so it's super super fascinating seeing her navigate the game and volume two had so much progress where she is feeling more confident to make her own choices in the game where we see actually the affection points be quite high in comparison to her experience playing the game which is absolutely incredible to see and we are nearing the plot line of the lost you know princess what would you call a duke's daughter duchess i don't know but where the lost daughter is supposedly going to make her way back soon. And so Penelope is trying to stop it all from happening because it is a part of the game anyway, like she's played it. And so she's trying to stop that at all costs or at least get the affection points up so high that it won't matter whether Yvonne the lost daughter makes her way back or not. I have seen some reviews for this one in volume four and it seems like people are really rooting for, I think his name is Callisto and he's like the really bad guy. Like he's like the unhinged guy who like kills everybody. Everybody's rooting for him and I'm like, why are, why are we, why is that, why, why? We'll see where this takes me. I'll keep you updated.
I am very comfy where I'm at right now. So welcome to the update. I did finish Villains Are Destined to Die Volume 3. And this feels like a bit of a step down. And it's only because there was so much back and forth. Gaining affection points, losing affection points. And so it almost felt like this ping pong effect of, again, gaining, losing. That was a bit frustrating to read about. And it didn't seem like there was any real progression in the story. Like there weren't any like big discoveries. There weren't any big like moves being made like they were made in volumes one and two. And although we did get a bit more backstory into the character's life outside the game and the way that it parallels with the game, it seems like the main character more than anything may have something to learn or to gain from being inside the game and sharing as many similarities as she does with Penelope. And maybe part of the lesson is handling a lot of situations differently, which is something that we see I think very clearly in this volume and so her understanding of certain situations is higher and the way that she navigates that is better because of her outside experiences which I think is really cool as, as outside knowledge going into the game but other than that I think I'm more excited at the moment just because we've seen her so intimately with Reynolds and Derek and Eccles which are some of the love interests I really want to see her with Kali still a bit more so I do think I agree with the people in the sense that well I guess people ship them more than anything and I haven't quite gotten there yet but I would like to see more of that dynamic and see exactly how she'll gain affection points because Calisto is the one that is the hardest to gain points for a challenge is what we need right now <laughs> but because she's so scared of him and so scared of dying and like losing all affection points she doesn't interact with him a whole lot and so I kind of want to see more of that I want to see more of Callisto, want to see even more of Winter, which he did make an appearance in this volume. And so I'm excited about volume four, but the ending for this one didn't leave me, I guess, quite as excited as like the other volumes. So I'm going to give this four stars. I feel like I look like death itself. However, let us get into the office. Yellow lighting really is the bane of my existence. Look at that. It's awful. Point is, I'm here to pick out my next read, which is going to be Family Lore by Elizabeth Acevedo, because I have the audio for this on Libby. My hold is expiring in three days, which I think is doable, because like the audio is less than 10 hours long. And so if I listen to it today, tomorrow, a little bit the day after, I do think I may just have it done before it returns back to the library. And please hold. I am working on this beautiful, stunning, it's caught my hair, a diamond painting. So this is what I'm going to be working on while I listen to my little audio. I have to fetch my AirPods as well so that I can get on to listening and grab a bookmark. So I need to put on my arm brace to protect my wrist and on to diamond painting and listening to my audiobook. I'm so excited about it. I feel like I've said the words I'm so excited too many times throughout this video, but I am. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. I really do feel like I look in between a mix of an evil secretary and then a Teletubby. And I don't know what to do with that information, but that's just where we're at. I also feel like I, I look or maybe I feel like a professional artiste now that I have got the arm brace on. I'm like, let's draw, friends. Cannot draw to save my fucking life, but we're sat down. We have got the audiobook right there for family lore. I have also got my trusty little physical copy. And let me show you the diamond painting up close so that you can see how stunning this is under the light. Literally look at the way that shines. It's so freaking stunning. And then there are pieces that are more like holographic. I think they call it like fairy dust or something along those lines. So I can't wait to make more progress with this as I listen to my little bookie book.
as always these angles are a work of art if i do say so myself but it is officially past midnight it is 12 13 and when i tell you guys all i want is to go to bed i am not even kidding i did diamond paint and i did listen to family lore which is fantastic got my physical copy right here managed to read 58 pages or rather listen to 58 pages of the book and i am loving this so 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 much oh no i'm bending the flap there is just something so comforting about elisabeth acevedo's books and something obviously so very latin about them that just feels like home from the spanglish all the way to the very specific references like walter mercado and in this one we observe the inner happenings of their lives and this family as a whole I particularly see that through the lens of four sisters primarily flor matilde pastora and camila who all have their respective abilities flor is a sort of seer so she can foresee people's deaths through her dreams so they are sort of premonitions and i love that elizabeth acevedo is very much playing into latin superstition of if you dream of certain things if you dream about specific numbers or happenings they all obviously have their own specific meanings and it's surely something that spans throughout several different cultures but in my experience as obviously a latin woman it's so prevalent like when i tell you guys my grandma whenever anybody has weird dreams she's like oh let me look up what number that is so that i can buy the lottery ticket to see if we win it's like such a huge thing then we've got pastora who has an affinity for people's truths or lies so she can tell if people are being truthful or not camila who is kind of like the forgotten sister she's kind of like the black sheep of the family she's not really around and she has an affinity for herbs and then matilde has no abilities that are known and then we have got some of their daughters who also have affinities of their own and the book has alternating timelines as well where we see their lives as they live in new york city but we also flash back to before they got to new york city City and before they migrated over there and they were still in Santo Domingo, República Dominicana. It basically starts with Flor watching a documentary and her having the grandiose idea that she will host a living wake for herself. Now, obviously, because of her particular gift, it raises the question of did she foresee her own death or why exactly are we doing a wake for a living person? And so we hear about their own individual lives and their discoveries as Latin women living in the states and again in their life in santo domingo in the backdrop of them planning and grouping up for this living wake and it really feels like people are watching chando like they're just telling you the latest goss and they're kind of recounting all of these different things that have happened in their lives it almost feels like very documentary style which i find very very fascinating so i'm having a really really good time and i will update you guys a bit more tomorrow morning because I do want to go to bed and my brain is not like even just the mention of sleep oh my god I'm so sorry even just the mention of sleep has got me yawning so I think it's time for me to turn in good morning friends I feel like a truck ran over me because I only got six hours of sleep today but it is what it is that's what I get for going to bed at basically 1 a.m after reading all day yesterday it is 9 a.m so I need to head up to the gym literally right now because my trainer is already up there so I need to go up and train but I am taking my airpods and I am going to be listening to family lore while I train so that I can get some more reading done specifically when I do cardio I love listening to audiobooks and so that's what I'm going to do so that I can knock out some more of it but I don't know that I'm going to be reading like a whole lot now because there's only two hours of the readathon left but just thought I'd update you good morning it is the next day and this is just where we're at this is like the realistic version of a 24-hour readathon where time gets interrupted by family members and then I go to the gym and do my thing and then I sleep six hours and then I read the rest of the time. So technically half of the readathon was like sleep and interruptions while the other half was reading, which I would say in a 24-hour period reading for 12 hours, maybe a bit more than that, I would say it's a win. Well, friends, guest was a clown and who did not read a single thing today. I called it earlier where I was like, I don't know how much reading I'm actually gonna get done. I feel like that 12-hour period and then like that 12-hour break was kind of the perfect 
ideal time to be readathoning for and like the perfect in between split two things. And I was correct because I didn't read a single thing this morning. I literally focused on editing the blooper reel that I edit every single month to put on to Patreon. And so I was sifting through hundreds and hundreds of clips from July all the way to September so that I could choose the very specific clips that did have bloopers for the reel. And so I did that. And then I started doing laundry and I got distracted. And throughout all of it, I didn't even pop on my audio. I tried listening to the audio while I was working out, but my trainer was very talkative today. So I listened to literally two minutes before that was short lived. And so absolutely nothing of family lore was listened to today, but that's okay because some readathons just look like that. Some readathons will be more productive than others. And I'd still say progress with one book, finishing two mindfuck books, and then reading this manual volume is still pretty much a success. Rounding it up, I basically read 700 pages. Hope that you guys enjoyed this video, even if I technically failed the readathon. What standard are we using for this? Give this video a massive thumbs up if you did. Comment down below if you have read any of the books here, and what are like maybe some dark romances that could potentially have similar vibes to the mindfuck series, or even if it has different vibes, let a girl know. I have been curious about Hunting Adeline. Hunting Adeline? I don't know how to pronounce like the actual name of the title, but I have been thinking about it. I've been looking at it. I own it. And so I do think that maybe the next one I dive into, there's that. If you reach the end of the video, let us leave some flower emojis because of the cover for family lore. And this also has flowers. So let us leave some flower emojis down in the comments. If you reach the very end, subscribe down below if you haven't done so already for more content like this. And if if you want to support the channel further, do have a Patreon. We have a bunch of cool stuff happening over there and little extras that I don't necessarily upload on my channel because they may or may not be book related. And so if you want that, plus a book club and live shows and a lot of fun stuff, Patreon is always linked down below. Again, it's a nice little extra. And alongside that, you can find all of my socials. Love you all the absolute mostest. And I will see you on the next one. Goodbye!